Hey, I'm Johnny Drive-By. Why don't you turn your dial to the atheist edge? Are you ready? No, but let's do it anyway. Genetically modified organisms. I'm for them, and here's why. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm not a pro on this, so if you know something about this, feel free to jump in. But I'd say I, my understanding is there's not a lot of like, clinical evidence that there's a problem with GMOs, but it sounds really, really scary. Like, it does. Like... In, in a sci-fi way, like this, if I were writing a sci-fi dystopia where humanity had gotten erased to a sliver and was fighting to survive, I could see it being because genetically modified corn, like erase the sperm of 90% of people or something like that. Like that would I, be a premise. I think a lot of this came from Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <clears throat> um, this started this this grand fear that you know basically our own science is going to somehow get out of hand and and hurt us in the long run right mm -hmm. because you know like our technology is going to jump faster than our knowledge mm -hmm. and that we're going to inadvertently step into some area that 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 we can't contain we're going to go beyond our own knowledge and it's going to destroy us but the whole purpose of the genetic modified organisms it, it, as far as i'm concerned is to provide more nutrition to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I guess if I guess if the drawback is that a few tomatoes grow teeth and come after me, I mean, I'll I'll survive. And then there, there's a way, there's a way you could market it that like some people will be into that. It's it's the food that eats you back. <laughs> there you go. And you want to get it? All right. Um, Monsanto right big organization mm -hmm. they will sue um past uh, fields of wheat <coughs> corn that are nearby because if if the wind blows a certain direction their gmo products go into a, a field that they don't have control over they'll sue that other company they'll sue that other farm um they genetically modified their corn for for instance uh, to be uh resistant to their pesticide called roundup they don't want other crops to be so if there's corn that's resistant to roundup how is that unhealthy to us it's just resistant to a pesticide so a lot of these gmos i don't think are are um uh, unhealthy to us it's just helping them resist pesticides mm -hmm. uh or insects better and by the way roundup right. is the one that's was causing people cancer and that we shouldn't be using anyway mm -hmm. so right. Well, but, but Jason, you made the point of, uh, of things allowing agriculture and feeding more populations. And so it's only because of genetic, genetic modification that we've been able to feed the population that we have now. Um, but at the same time, I think people who are against GMOs probably for bad reasons. But I think one of the arguments is that there's a, an issue with certain major companies um, damaging other smaller farmers' crops in favor of their own because of the modifications that they're making. Um, and so there's there's an argument that, like, if it's genetically modified, then it's mm -hmm. not, um, not ethically made or something, uh, or it's damaging to smaller farms. And so there's, I've heard that, but in terms of, like, GMOs being a, a danger word or a bad word, I don't think that that's anything because basically everything is genetically modified now so but that's the price of progress with a lot of technology we get more efficient we are able to do things better and unfortunately smaller less effective less efficient groups you know whether they're you know small individual farmers or or producers mm -hmm. or they always end up suffering for the most part mm -hmm. yeah i mean Monsanto as a company, how they are anti-competitive and whether you should be able to copyright patent genes at all. That's, for the sake of time, we could set that aside because that could be a whole other topic on its own. But as far as just that the idea of genetically modified organisms, like if there is data, if there's clinical studies showing that it's dangerous, fine. But I think a lot of it is fear-mongering and just uh, fear of population for something that is new from what they don't understand. Yeah, if you're creating a corn that's going to give everyone a cancer, uh, that's gonna 
that's going to go south pretty quickly because you're going to lose the base that you're feeding. I think <clears throat> I think it's kind of funny to to, to mention. Um, everybody knows Ray Comfort and uh, his banana bit that he does. Mm -hmm. What's funny is he says he, he makes the arg he makes the argument. Oh, uh, it's perfectly made by God for humans, right? Well, actually, if anybody's ever eaten a banana or knows anything about bananas, the banana that we have today is nothing what original bananas were, and mm -hmm. we modified them to look and be the way they are today. And it's funny that Ray mm -hmm. points to it as being God that did that. No, it was us. <laughs> but it's it's perfectly fits in my hand. That's, That's the only comfort food that I have an issue with. <laughs> Tune in for more wit like that on Atheist Edge. Okay. B -b 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 Bonus round. <laughs> I'm going to give you guys a choice this time. You want new atheism or Star Trek? I personally want Star Trek. Okay, Star more... Trek. So, better than Star Wars? Yes. Lately, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think I think it's interesting about Star Trek is the way it presents a. It, it, it posits a utopian post-scarcity society on Earth, which kind of gets into some of the other topics we've been kind of talking about uh, through these random subjects. And I, I, I like to think that we could get there, like have everyone working together and not have uh, basic survival needs be an issue to the point where we can invest in like deep space human transit. Um, but... I, I, I gotta say, from what I, I see of human nature on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't see us getting to that level of cooperation anytime soon. I know what you think. Yeah, it's gonna definitely be a long time, and there's a lot of other situations that are going to have to get worked out. Um, but what I think is interesting is the whole idea that they are supposed to go and sort of learn about different societies and alien species and worlds and stuff, but not necessarily insert themselves mm -hmm. into those situations. But they always do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they always somehow do. They can't help themselves. Yeah. And I think that that's a really big part of the human condition. They, the, the one good thing is that f for the most part, they want to help. And so something that I that I had mentioned in, in my other recording was that, you know, as we have more time that we're doing less, have to do less to take care of our, ourselves over time, uh, we have possibly more time to help and work with other people to help them out. You know, I think that that's just what our nature could could turn towards. So mm -hmm. if we find another world, we find another group of people or civilization or whatever, we're going to want to probably go help, you know, mm -hmm. versus necessarily go in, and conquer right away. Mm -hmm. I hope that we will, that our society will turn towards that probably won't we'll probably have a lot of fear and uncertainty and it's mm -hmm. going to get very hostile very quickly but i like the idea of of the star trek universe where mm -hmm. we have this confidence i guess in maybe our own technology and, and just who we are that yeah we can go and and visit mm -hmm. and explore without mm -hmm. that necessary uh necessarily the fear mm -hmm. yeah maybe something that's being put out there as an ideal to strive towards rather than necessarily something that is necessarily realistic. I mean, when it was made in the 60s originally, you know, you had Russian crew members, you had African American crew members, and that would have been, that was a really unusual thing for that time period. But it's suggesting a thing where, hey, we've, we've gotten over race issues, we've gotten over Cold War issues, and we can now come together for larger endeavors. And it would be great if we got there. Um, I, I hope I'm being more pessimistic and we actually do make it there. But it, it seems like every time humans try and get together to do stuff, there's some conflict or something gets in the way. And I, I shouldn't be, in fact, this is my pessimism. But uh, yeah. It's... I would love a universe where all of our universes can come together. So, you know, Worf and mm -hmm. Chewbacca can go on a space adventure together. In the Millennium Enterprise and, and oh. save the galaxy. I see you've been reading my fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait till they get to the one where they meet Goku. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fantastic. Dragon Trek Z. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I say something? Yes. While you're, while you're doing that? <clears throat> so, yeah. 
I, I like the, I think it's a cool, it might be a, a neat idea to think of a world government and all that, but dude, I mean, I, national sovereignty is a thing, that pesky national sovereignty, and I, I think that's a pie in the sky idea that one day that we'll be all under, like all human beings are going to be under one governing body. I don't, I just don't see it happening. There are too many disparate mm -hmm. cultures in our uh, civilization, mm -hmm. um, and not all cultures are equal. Some are better than others. Uh, some cultures uh, don't mesh with other cultures, and that, that's always going to be the case, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but, uh, yeah, I do... So the one thing that I always did like, though, was the one episode where um, uh, Picard tells somebody that's arguing with him about um, the Prime Directive, and he says, you know, well, these people have already given up their belief, uh, have already left superstition and God beliefs behind. And who, so who am I to take that away from them? Because it was, they were looked, they were being looked at as some kind of superior God race or something because it was a backwards culture or whatever. And they didn't know anything about tech, you know, the technology and everything. So Picard was basically saying, yeah, I'm not good. They, they, they overcame their superstition and stuff and I'm not going to take that away from them. So I thought that was a cool atheist mm -hmm. moment in Star Trek. So. I'm going to disagree with a culture being better than another um, yeah. quite strongly. Yeah. That would be, so that would be a hilarious tangent that okay. would probably go on for hours So a and culture hours. that thinks it's well, okay we're probably to gonna do it people, anyway. is that a good culture? Is it a good culture? There are cultures that are cannibals. Is that a good culture? Um, <laughs> oh. I'm for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I originally, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, just recently got to go to the uh, Origins Museum at the Perot Museum in Dallas. And that was really fantastic to learn about uh, Neanderthals uh, as well as um, our, as well as the ancestry of our, you know, humanity right now. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think about Neanderthals in particular? They're fine. I mean, they're gone. <laughs> uh, my, my understanding was they, they coexisted with humanity for a while. And um, it, it's interesting from a... It, it's, it's a it really interesting to try and talk to creationists about them because they are a hominid group that didn't come from Adam and Eve, clearly. And they weren't really apes in the way we think of apes and they're not really accounted for well in a biblical narrative uh, so i don't know if they're trying to i don't know where they would you'd have to ask a creationist but i don't know where they would try and fit them in they're just a problem um, but for evolution it's kind of really it's actually cool to see the that humanity is well, like all other species we are the victors among for what a while we're probably several options and we are just ha we are happen to be the ones that were fittest and best for the environment that happened to survive. Whereas, um, for whatever reasons, I don't know if Neanderthals just completely died out, or if they all interbred uh, with with Homo sapiens or something like that. And but but they left behind enough to kind of get a image of what they were like. And I find that stuff interesting to look at. Yeah, if if, if you do genetic testing, there's. Uh a certain subset of the population that does have Neanderthal in their uh, genetic makeup. So we, we did interbreed with them at one point and then we're kind of slowly breeding them out now, but it's very interesting. I really found it interesting when, so when I was looking at the, the Homo sapien mm. population, how, uh, you know, looking at two different sets of, of fossils from that origins museum, mm -hmm. we've got the, we've got the humans, uh, or the, the Homo sapien branch that had these shorter stocky legs and mm -hmm. these um, uh, like broader shoulders and they thought that they were more you know mountain uh, climbing and then mm -hmm. you've got the the other Homo sapiens who had um, a little bit longer legs and also much longer arms that were that were closer to um, what we would see in in apes mm -hmm. and chimpanzees and I find it really interesting that you know, despite all of those different branches that somehow we get here and then we have Neanderthals and I'm sure that they've got all of their different traits within their, mm -hmm. their subset. And I, I, I have a really hard time wrapping my, my mind around 
where we where we end and where others begin and it it really is so helpful to go to museums like that mm -hmm. and really see where the branches go up and where they um, where we think that they meet and then where they definitely don't meet mm -hmm. and I don't know a ton about Neanderthals mm -hmm. to to be honest but I know that there's like you said there's theories that they may have starved out that we may have fought them to extinction mm -hmm. there are a lot of different ways and I don't know how to feel about that because I wasn't involved. I don't. I, I don't have any like anger against Neanderthals. You mm -hmm. know, trying to fight back against us. It's really sad that they mm -hmm. died out. Uh, to uh, to Courtney's bring up, it's n interesting to have uh, genetic proof hundreds of thousands of years later that some guys will just fuck anything. <laughs> oh, I think we bred them. I think we bred with them. Interbred with them. For yeah. well, that's what, yeah, that's what. yeah, and it's it's really hard to. to you know, we see them as separate, but, you know, with that genetic testing, we see that we still kind of intermingled uh, or mingled. And I don't know, it makes humanity that much more complex. Yeah, it, it, it kind of raises a question of uh, what, what it really means to be human. Like, right. as, like if you're asked that question 100,000 years ago, you might get a, a little less clear of an answer. Yeah, their their language was not as, as evolved as it is now. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like really weird grunts and we'd have to grunt back so, <laughs> someone someone figured out the magic grunts to uh, get some sweet sweet neanderthal action so uh on that uh highbrow note we'll uh we'll end this one and so we have plenty more random stuff to talk about in future episodes so stay tuned Atheist age. And then uh, when you're ready for your first word, I'll send oh, it to you. Oh, okay. It's a game. Okay, cool. So you want to introduce it? Yeah, just let me know when we're rolling. Walking the edge of what some consider offensive. But your feelings don't matter here. Only facts. This is the main one. Hey, I, you may not want to have me on uh, this one. Courtney's our lighting guy. Look, you may not want to have me on this one. Just uh, a heads up, because when that driver gets here, I've got to go out and meet him. That's all right edgy commentary on the dangers of doctrine, the foibles of faith. Good Not point. leave, leave, but leave and Good come point, back. TJ. Good point. What's up? Hi. Hey, Colin. <laughs> You're, you'll be all the business. Apparently we're doing this thing. The bullshit of belief, the stupidity of superstition, and the idiocy of indoctrination. This is like an improv thing, but where like you're just changing out who's in the scene randomly. Yes. With razor sharp wit, Curiosity and critical thought. He writes copy. I, I'm both. He I'm multifaceted. Yeah. He yeah. writes with horrible grammar and lets someone else fix it. He's bi journalistic. <laughs> <laughs> we take an unblinking look at today's religions. So we are continuing our series where two unlucky hosts slash guests get asked to expound on random topics for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Mm. That's what we're doing, folks, so let's see how it goes. This is the way to truth. Yes. <laughs> truth through randomness. We are Atheist Edge. Okay. We're doing a show, actually. Okay, start over. Hi, we're professionals. Oh. 